Look, I want to start with our mission. We are disrupting microbiology culture plate reading. It's really simple. It's really specific. And that's because the microbiology market is huge and it's really ripe for disruption. So if we go to the first slide after the disclaimer, I uh, you know, really wanted to wrap up kind of the investment highlights in one, in one slide, just to kind of get your attention, if you like. We are a commercial stage company. We are generating revenue. Our technology, back to our mission, automates culture plate reading in microbiology. It's a validated hardware platform, as well as an AI capability. Importantly, it's a single platform and architecture, and we're focused at the moment on two really major markets. It's clinical microbiology and pharmaceutical quality control microbiology. And when you look at each of those markets, we have really big companies that are backing the technology. Dermo Fisher are our exclusive distributors for APAS in the clinical market. AstraZeneca is funding as well as partnering with us for the pharma market. Uh, and Thermo Fisher are involved in that process as well from a funding perspective. There's a, a real opportunity here for value creation as we look to build our existing sales and, and, and look at really targeting what is a growing $3.5 billion total addressable market. Next slide kind of takes a step back. Let me talk about the microbiology market. The Petri dish was invented in the late 1800s and it is uh, a highly efficient uh, and effective method to identify microbial growth uh, or bacteria. A picture of, uh, of a Petri dish is on the right hand side of the screen. Today in every lab around the world, it is a microbiologist that will hold a plate and look at a plate and make an assessment. There is a global shortage of microbiologists in the US at any one time, 10% of microbiology jobs are vacant. And because of that, we've got this issue of increasing salaries at the same time. When you go into a microbiology lab, you literally have hundreds and sometimes in the larger labs, thousands of these Petri dishes that are read by, by a microbiologist sitting at a workbench. And obviously that's naturally going to lead to inconsistent results and the potential for, for mistakes to occur. It's an absolutely perfect opportunity to really disrupt what is a really manual process with advanced technologies that are available into in the 21st century today. And next slide talks about our solution, right? That's exactly what we've done. Uh, we've invented and brought to market an automated culture plate reader. We call it APAS independence. A picture of it, you can see there on the screen on the left-hand side. It's pretty simple, the way it works. You load the instrument, with these Petri dishes on the left-hand side, you start a session and the whole idea is you then walk away. And the reason you do that is because APAS really, that does all the processing and does all of the work. Plates move from the left-hand side of the instrument through the imaging chamber and images taken of a plate and algorithm interprets what's on that plate, takes about 13 seconds and a decision is made. Based on that decision, plates are then moved to the right-hand side of the instrument and they're moved into various stacks based on that decision that's automatically been made by the algorithm. Customers who are using the product have reported cost savings. They've improved, they, they've, they've outlined productivity gains. And, and these are the reasons why, you know, kind of looking at 60 to 80% of these plates are removed out of the workflow. And that's why it's a key value proposition to customers and where their money and their time is being saved. Next slide talks about both of these kind of market disciplines, both clinical and pharma. And, and look, our strategy is to disrupt the discipline of microbiology as a whole. And we've developed a single instrument to do that. And we've now got multiple algorithms or software to target these segments. So kind of think of it like an iPhone. We've got the hardware already developed, it's validated, it's in the market. And what we're doing now is developing different apps for the hardware that allow us to get into these different, different sectors. The R&D for this is mainly complete. Um, look, I've explained uh, before, you're kind of looking at clinical and pharma. On the clinical side, think of infectious diseases, urinary tract infection as an example of what that kind of lab would focus on. And our customers are hospitals or private pathology labs. On the pharma side, we're looking at sterile manufacturing. So best example, perhaps drug manufacturing. And so clearly that segment, our customers are pharmaceutical companies. Next slide talks about our revenue model. It's a combination of a CapEx as well as an annuity style uh, license payment. So the annual software license is for the algorithm itself. 
and this is the consumable, if you like. Uh, we see the typical payback of kind of two to four years for our customers, and that outlines predominantly the efficiency gains that the instrument um, provides to these labs. Next slide talks about the APAS clinical market. So again, now just focusing on APAS clinical and Thermo Fisher are really uh, the, uh, the, the leaders of culture plate media uh, in North America and certainly a big contributor in, in Europe. It's a really symbiotic relationship. You think, you know, our product is a hardware platform, it automates culture plate reading, and then you've got a provider, Thermo Fisher, who are in all of our customer sites selling their media already. So a, a partnership that has product synergies already in place. They've sold product already, and recently this year we expanded that distribution into Europe, and that was following an already established relationship where they were distributing for us in the US. So very positive there. Uh, next slide, please. Look, I've mentioned this is a, a, a stage of company that we are in revenue, we've already got a product and it is extensively already proven and validated. So we've got the regulatory clearances, it is the only regulated product that is FDA cleared, that is CE IVDR cleared uh, for us to sell into, into both obviously Europe uh, and the United States. And we've got a number of publications that are available on our website that demonstrate both the scientific rigor and validity of the instrument, but importantly, the cost savings and the performance to our end customers. Next slide talks about pharma, so switching gears now. <clears throat> and quality control in drug manufacturing is critical and failed results have a huge impact on pharmaceutical companies. <clears throat> Some interesting stats I've kind of outlined on the slide here, and they're very much relevant to APAS. Of the 483s or potentially the warning letters, these are the regulatory observations, they have really high consequences from a revenue and, uh, and a cost perspective. And when you look at some of these observations that were made, they were primarily focused around data integrity and traceability. And that's where it's a key driver for automation, right? Regulators and industry are already driving uh, manufacturers into looking at technology to adopt um, to, to improve these areas of, of data integrity. Uh, next slide talks are around why APAS is, is so beneficial. And, 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 and the fact that we've got funding, $1.7 million of contracted funding, really uh, cornerstone by AstraZeneca, who are our customer, right? So that, that's our customer um, who, are, who are funding this. Thermo Fisher would love to be a distributor of the product. There's nothing binding there, but clearly they're they have the media supply. So they have some interest there in supporting the R&D work to, to support their media across the other medias that we look uh, to support uh, uh, in, in the portfolio. We've recently installed an APAS independence at AstraZeneca and we're, at, we're generating real interest from other pharma companies in this segment. And we're saying we're expecting to place at least one other instrument uh, before the end of the year at another pharma um, company. And we're expecting sales to occur in 2024. Importantly, you know, this is an existing hardware platform that, that we've developed. So this is not another three to five year development. We've started developing early this year and we're saying validation should be done towards the end of this year through AstraZeneca as a partner and sales starting next year. Uh, next slide talks about product pipeline because we're not done there yet. Uh, in order for us to really deliver on our, on our vision to disrupt all of microbiology, we need to have a hardware platform that caters for those smaller labs. So we've already got APAS independence. That's the high throughput instrument really for the larger and the smaller labs. While we see a great opportunity to have a lower cost platform and importantly, it uses the same imaging station as the APAS independence. And so therefore all of the algorithms, these apps that we've developed are immediately compatible in the smaller instrument. So, you know, you kind of think we've got funded for this again through a, a government grant, a, a shorter time to market because we're reusing components and we get the benefit of the reuse of the existing algorithms uh, immediately. Next slide talks about some of the financials and we know that there is uh, importance around moving towards the momentum of a path to break even. And I think from a company perspective, as we see the sales traction build, where we're wanting to help investors kind of visualize that path to, to break even. We have leaned out our cost base and that's really because most of the R&D work is complete. And we do expect that future R&D, which is really more incremental 
development of the algorithms itself, uh, apart from the, the new smaller instrument that we spoke about, uh, to be funded. And I think we've demonstrated that through the funding uh, in the Pharma QC part, as well as some of the match funding we've got from the federal government. Uh, and look, we see the revenue split uh, as an example on the far right of a potential scenario uh, around what a break even would look like. And, um, and we see a potential further or a quicker uptick, uptick potentially on the pharma side. So that revenue split could even shift a little bit more in favour of APAS Pharma from what we're seeing. So look, in, in summary, we, uh, we've spent over $50 million uh, on this technology over the last eight to 10 years. The platform is robust and it's ready. And we've got major attention from big companies who are backing the product and backing our company, namely Thermo Fisher, AstraZeneca. They're funding development for a new application. They obviously uh, want to take advantage of the technology. And when you look at the market cap of where we're at now compared to what we've been able to deliver and the risk profile, there's a real opportunity here for value creation. And when we're looking at what our outlook looks like uh, around getting product into this new segment, around making progress on the sales, on the clinical side, moving towards a path to break even, there's a really fantastic opportunity, we believe, um, for shareholders to, to start looking at this story. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Brent. Um, someone likes your presentation. It's uh, your stock's up twenty percent. I just noticed. Um, yeah. Now you've you recently raised one and a half million dollars in, in a placement. So how are those funds to be allocated? Yeah, look, they were they were really intended to support along with the development for the uh, APAS Pharma um, application. So there was a bit around product development there, but principally that was focused on supporting Thermo Fisher and our commercialization activities on the APAS clinical. So we've, we've had a year um, already for, uh, for Thermo Fisher in the US. And based on that first year of exclusive distribution in the US, we've now expanded that to all of Europe. So it's added another 34 countries in Europe. And so we've spent a lot of time in the, in the first few months of this year in Europe, working with the European Thermo sales teams uh, to really get that market set up because we really want to take advantage of what we've learned on that first year with Thermo in the US and carry forward all of those lessons learned um, and, and hand over all of the leads that we had already established. And, and I think you mentioned you kind of you expect a rapid uh, adoption in pharma compared to clinical. Um, what was that? I guess when you consider drug manufacturing, it's a highly regulated process and what we see there is therefore there's a highly consistent process that exists throughout manufacturing facilities, both within uh, one organization such as AstraZeneca, but also across the industry. And so when you kind of look at consistency of process, that adoption curve for automation is one where I've described as, as a land and expand strategy. And so we would look to install the instrument where it'd be validated in one manufacturing site and once that validation occurred, because of the consistency and process across the group, it would allow for a much more vast and quicker standardization of a platform across multiple manufacturing facilities. And, and it's an industry where you have to partner. Uh, you touched on AstraZeneca and its rollout of APAS. What exactly does that mean? And is, and is it rolling out through the manufacturing sites? That's certainly their intention. Um, you know, look, they're, they're funding $1.1, $1.2 million after looking at all the other alternatives in the market. And so, you know, they're not only a funding partner, they're a development partner of ours. We installed the instrument last month. They're capturing images for us. We're developing the algorithm. Uh, and certainly, you know, you think that investment in time and resources and capital, their intention is absolutely to standardise across their manufacturing uh, network. And so, you know, I'd kind of indicated sales occurring in 2024, so next year, and we're really envisaging having a lot of that validation work completed in this calendar year with that one customer. Uh, and that would lead to the start, we believe, of a, of a rollout throughout their business starting uh, in 2024 calendar year. And, and then you touched on your partnership with Thermo Fisher. Um, they're moving you into Europe. Um, do you expect any sales to come out of that uh, sooner rather than later? We do. I mentioned there was a bit of focus with our teams in, in Europe in the first few months of the year. And we, we obviously have been working in that, in that market for the last uh, few years with Beckman Coulter. I terminated, or the company terminated that uh, agreement. We've expanded the, the, the relationship we've got with Thermo Fisher. So we've handed over the leads that, we, that we've had. And part of that is some advanced opportunities that we would absolutely expect to be able to close out as sales uh, throughout 
this calendar year. And, and Brent, just finishing up, there's a question around the IP. Can you give us a background on that? Yeah, the IP is all in the imaging station and the algorithm. So it's a family of four patents. It covers the uh, the lighting, the calibration tools, and the algorithm itself. I mean, everyone loves AI now, but we started this 10 years ago before AI was a buzzword and chat GPT was around. The algorithm itself is patent protected. It's not an off-the-shelf Google.ai algorithm. So we've got a really strong portfolio of patents that cover the core imaging and image analysis capability. Brent, that's all we have time for. Thanks uh, for your presentation. You made great progress. Uh, we'll follow with interest. Thanks, Tim.